appreciate that um, we all come from a similar background in the sense of we're all, and most all attendees are like professionals in the field of uh, prevention or like practitioners in the field of prevention or demand reduction in general. Um, but um, the topic I'm going to address today, I'll try to address it from a perspective in terms of like when we are engaged uh, with schools, um, what sort of messages are essential for schools to know in order to really strengthen their prevention responses in line with the messages that we portray in the international standards on drug use prevention. So let's start with the starting background that you probably are more than familiar with um, because this is one of the core components of UPC. Uh, the international standards, what they are. The international standards are tools that help policymakers understand how to think about prevention. Their main tool is less so on um, how to do prevention, but more like how to think in prevention and really what works, what does not work. So you have an, an informed background in the sense of decision making when you want to do prevention in the field. I will go into more details about it, but um, of course, there are two versions of the prevention standards, one from 2013 um, and one from 2018 that is, as we speak, in the process of being reviewed. The difference between them, aside renewing, refreshing what happened within the five years difference between the two, is the fact that the way the literature has been reviewed and the evidence has been reviewed in the 2018 version applied the WHO criteria of evidence, and that's why you see the WHO criteria on it. This adds further value for the policymakers uh, to understand that this is science that really is based on core um, knowledge and solid knowledge of science uh, that really has to pass a certain threshold of um, determination of, of strength of evidence in order to pass the WHO standards of prevention. We're living in the context of COVID-19 right now. Um, and that is appreciated even more um, how much it is imported for um, uh, for prevention um, uh, to 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 be accounted by um, the prevention standards. So um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a remote request control request. I'm not sure if I should approve or decline, but yeah, maybe. I'll uh, decline for now. Uh, so, um, what is the prevention standard? What is their content? Is is one of the main essential starting point to understand, to to pass through schools and for not schools at the school level only, but at the school administration, at the Ministry of Education, at the maybe at the um, community level, maybe at the state level, maybe at also at the um, national level. Everybody, all the elements that are working on prevention have to be on the same wavelength of how to appreciate and what to understand in terms of what prevention is. The I have some sound bits to share with you that are essentials to, to have across the board when approaching drug prevention per the prevention standard. First of all, is the issue of science, because there are lots of improvisation in the field of prevention of drug use, less so in the field of treatment of drug use uh, disorders, but in the field of prevention, there is more creativity and uh, a less appreciation of the science. And the fact that we have applied WHO criteria in terms of strength of evidence is already a very important sign for the policymakers to understand that not anything done under a prevention umbrella is prevention. It has to be based on science. The second important message is that science reflect the fact that prevention of drug use goes beyond just raising awareness about drugs and talking about the dangers of drugs. Um, that is only scratching the surface. And I will talk about it into more detail for um, you know, how we pro provide that message of convincing them that it's beyond uh, awareness raising. Another very important message for uh, policymakers, and that is a loose term I'm using at, at several levels, right? For me, like a school administrator could be a policymaker in that perspective. So anybody who is making a decision of what they want to do in schools, for example, and that as we're discussing it, an important message is that initiation of drug use, especially at an early age of development, is not the result of a free personal choice. So it's not a matter of a child or an adolescent that a child can say yes or no to very simply and naively in terms of um, context. 
the issue is much deeper than that in terms of what triggers that yes and what supports that no is what needs to be accounted for. Um, prevention also, um, it comes as a surprise for policymakers as well that um, I talked about evidence that is with the strength of WHO standards. 90% um, of these packages that we're talking about are packages that do not discuss drugs at all. Actually, these are packages that help personal growth in terms of intellectual, language, cognitive, and social competency skills of these youth in different ages of development. And sometimes at a specific age, they discuss drugs, but it's not a necessarily core ingredient of them. So basically, the main element of this is to change the focus of these policymakers when addressing the problem, because most of them are concerned about the drug. How can I address drug? You know, drugs are challenging this, the community. There's drugs in the community where the focus is on the drug to refocus the attention of the policymakers from drug being the problem to more how to support that individual in different ages of development to resist <clears throat> the vulnerabilities <clears throat> that we will talk about that are associated in taking risky behaviors, including substance use. So the point of focus is not the drug. The point of focus is the person and how can I help that person? That's the general vulnerability matrix that we address within the prevention standards. And these policymakers have to be aware of it. When we're talking about using drugs, we're talking about vulnerabilities that are present within the person under the skin, things that determine who that person is, from the genes to the mental health and personality traits of that person, how their sensation seeking is, their impulsivity, their inattentiveness or attentiveness, their mental health situation, their neurological development, language delays, cognitive deficiencies, um, problem solving skills. Also, how they react to stress. Every single person has a different kind of uh, combination of characteristics of determining who they are as a person, right? But these people live with micro, within microstructures that react and interact with them. These microstructures, the most influential of which are the family, the school, and the peers. The family, how that family um, monitors the um, parenting styles, um, the role modeling within the family, how stressful the chaotic environment or chaotic is the environment within the family, is there substance use within the family, the school, um, the nature of the quality of the education, uh, the school climate, the, the health education within the schools, um, the peers, um, what sort of uh, normative beliefs exist within these peers, um, um, the level of antisocial linkage within them. So these structures interact and depending of who you are as a person, either attenuate or accentuate that vulnerability that exists in you. But also these microstructures are not uh, existing in vacuum. So a family that is living in a context of um, context of poverty, uh, conflict, displacement, um, a social environment of social inequalities, uh, a physical environment where there is, um, you know, neighborhood disorder, high level of accessibility to drugs or to violence or, or to weapons or to dog guns. All of these things affect uh, the microstructures per se, the parenting, the school, the peers, and also carry a direct effect on the individual. So that's an important construct that the policymaker need to have in mind. And if we see it from a different perspective, and we talk to the policymaker, let them know. Okay, assuming you have a child. Um, who's aggressive, let's say, is inattentive, with high reactivity to stress, with a bit of cognitive def def uh, deficiencies, right? And that child has a family structure that is either harsh or abusive at worst, or at best is neglectful. And in living in a school climate that is negative and with lots of negative peer influence around that child, and uh, and that child is living in a community where there is high level of social inequalities and violence as actually accessibility to drugs. So you can imagine that that child and the thousand of other children that are similar to them, to him or her, need from us as policymaker more than awareness raising uh, messages about what drugs are and uh, their dangers, and most importantly, needs. Um, things beyond just a message of just say no to drugs. They need to see how to address these vulnerability or how to help the structures around them super oversee these vulnerabilities. 
Another very important message in, is, in this is like when we're addressing and we're thinking about that modality of um, application of uh, prevention as a vulnerability matrix, we're not only preventing substance use, that same vulnerability is linked to a spectrum of risk outcomes going beyond just drugs. It improves mental health, uh, reduces violence at the community level, violence against children, improve educational attainment, and so many other risk factors. So the return on investment is much larger. And that's an important starting point. So the whole context starts from a perspective that the brain is a constant in a constant stage of socialization, um, you know, from based on your internal structure and how the environment around you reacts or interacts with you. And that's why it's important to really reflect on how every single developmental stage requires a different sort of attention um, and support in order to help the child go reach the milestone of development that are intended to be reached at that specific age of development. And then for those that are not fully convinced about this is a developmental issue and not really a decision-making issue of a yes, no, that is based on a free will, we usually remind them that, you know, regardless of the country you're in, wherever you are around the world, is there a question? Um, I'm happy to entertain questions along the way because I'm hearing sound in the background. I just want to be wary of... Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Wadi. I'm telling, I'm chatting that saying that they can send the question to the chat box and we'll answer. Excellent. Thank you. So, regardless of the age of, uh, you know, if the country we're talking about, whenever we ask about what is the age of initiation of substance use, um, almost any country where we are, the age of initiation ranges between the age of, let's say, 12, 13, 14, up to the age of 24, 25, 26. So it is within that specific age bracket that that decision of initiation of substance use occurred. If it was a free independent choice, I'm an epidemiologist myself, um, that free choice could have happened at any age of development after the age of 13. There is no reason why it happens within a specific window of age de of development. And if that initiation did not happen within that age window, the probability of it occurring is almost close to zero. So there is something about the development of the brain within that age group that is leading to the articulation of that risky behavior. And it's not a personal free choice. There is something beyond this. And I'm talking regardless of the substance of initiation. So in infancy, we're talking about a child that requires what, is, what does the brain need in terms of that development? Um, an environment that is responsive to them, um, a positive interaction with their caregivers, um, a stimulating environment so that they, they test all of their skills and like, adapt as they grow from one age to the other. Um, they have to learn how to, what message they need to send to in terms of um, uh, receive that attention and get the attention they need and how to, the environment needs to learn how to soothe them the environment, most of the case, are the caregivers, right? And how not to become temperamental. So basically, these are important milestones of development within infancy. By the way, I'm going to use these terms of age of development loosely without a specific category of age in terms of a number, because I'm talking about, let's say, the age when the child is unable to communicate, is, rec is recently born, and still unable to speak, right? That's, for me, is infancy. But like early childhood is the age when the child is able to speak but is not in school yet. So the child can communicate beyond screaming or crying or shouting, uh, but the child is not in school yet. So basically here we're preparing the child. What are milestones of development at that age of development? Language development, cooperation uh, skills, how to control emotions, um, how to have a collective conscience of who am I as a person, as a child, right? and who the adults are, what's an adult, what's a child, what's and all of these things, how to have, how to perceive my own emotion, am I angry, how to perceive the emotions and, and others, um, uh, how to solve essential problems that are for this age, for example, problem solving, I'm not talking about something big, but you know, at least to say like, this is an object that is near, that is something that is far, this is something that is big, that is tall, that is short, these are certain things that needs to be 
the child has to be able to understand and appreciate because these are essential things that prepare him or her to adapt to the next age of development, which is middle childhood, the age when they go inside school. So this is the age when they start school. These are the early school days. And this is the, the period when the child moves from being under the attention of their parents, their caregivers to a new environment where some of them have the innate skill of terms of building social relationships, but others require help. So the school is designed most of the time to kind of provide the tools to, to read, to write, to understand biology, chemistry, physics, but not necessarily always have the role to help kids overcome their the skills that they need at this age of development in terms of how to maintain attention, to control emotion, um, how to be socially inclusive and to be part of the social so different social networks, how to be effective in communication, how to be positively received by others, how to accurately perceive your emotions, either your own emotions or the emotions of others. These are all executive cognitive and emotional regulatory, regulatory functions that are essential at this age of development. And then you move to adolescence, and this is an age where, of course, now the child is, an, is at an a age of development where it's no longer a child, not an adult yet, but contemplating of what is an adult and how to react to the pressure of other peers and sometimes adult, how to have your own social emotional relationship building, how to be sensitive to the need of others, how to resolve conflict, pro-social skills and impulse control, um, how to have resistance skills if somebody puts you in risky behavior, how to say no, it's not like say no, but how to say no without losing your friendship with the, with your, with the others, or by while at the same time helping the other not to do the risky behavior, and also normative beliefs. This is an age when um, always peer pressure is perceived, especially within schools that, you know, a peer comes in, offers a substance to another kid and the kid has to say no to it. But in many, in, in most, the most common scenario is the fact that there is that 12, 13 year old child, uh, adolescent, right? Looking for the 16, 17 year old and having the impression of this is what 16 and 17 years old do, even though they're not doing the behavior in front of them, but for them, uh, youth smoke, um, they use marijuana, they drink. That is their normative belief. And how they perceive in terms of like, if I do use that substance, substance, I belong to the majority or the minority of the youth, for example, is an important normative thing to address. And I guess in the, within the context of COVID-19, we learn more, more and more about the importance of not only availing information, but also building the skills in adolescent of how to analyze information and to understand what information is correct and what information is wrong. And that's a skill that needs to be built. So again, within that context, you know, when the policymaker appreciate and understand yeah, that this is a developmental issue that I have to account for. It's not the drug, it's that person. I'm helping that person. It's also important to remember that boys and girls have different trajectory of growth and boys and girls have different um, way of reacting to the environment. So the responses that have to be put in place also have to account for the fact that some interventions are good for boys and girls, but some require more gender sensitivity to really support the developmental needs of that child, given their gender at that stage of development. So that is the general framework. That's a very important mining, uh, milestone in terms of engagement in schools and actually any other community setting where we're working to understand and appreciate of what we are talking about when it comes to prevention. And this opens a whole new tools of arsenal of intervention that, you know, I, again, I'm stressing it a bit, I'm overselling it, but by WH, because that's important, by WHO standard, that that level of, you know, threshold of um, criticality in terms of reaching evidence, um, there are lots of tools that exist with that level of evidence. So there is no need for that level of creativity. But most importantly, <clears throat> that prevention mode of thinking helps the policymakers re realize the fact that, you know, I do not have to address substance use only within adolescence. Um, I can start working on prevention of substance use when the child is still in the womb of the pregnant mother. That's how early I can start with interventions. And, and then at every single age of development, there are more and more tools that I can add, that can support. So I can redirect the path of that youth very early in the process and not necessarily wait for when it's too late. Because when I want to talk about drugs, I'm sure I cannot talk about drugs 
at a very early age. At least it's going to be at the age where kids start using. But that developmental perspective helped me readdress the issue much earlier. So when you see schools, this is when you see there is a lot of intervention that can be put in place. Um, one thing aside the ages that you see in front of you uh, that I want to highlight is the fact that also the interventions that we're reflecting on are at different level of on the spectrum of prevention, meaning that they're all, by the way, I'm talking about prevention of initiation of use. So in a way, it is primary prevention, prevention of initiation of use. But we're talking about certain intervention being uh, universal. So regardless of the level of risk, any child within the school can benefit from. And these are in green. Some of them are uh, selective, meaning for subpopulations um, that are at higher level of risk than the normal population. So they're more targeted in terms of intervention. These are in yellow. And there are indicated level of prevention in red. And these are for um, kids that are showing certain symptoms um, that need to be addressed early before they progress into something more significant. So if we unpack what's happening within schools, of course, there are packages that can start, as I said, in early childhood to prepare the children to go to school. But as you see, these are interventions that are in yellow, early, edu early childhood education. These uh, for a subgroup of the population that are at higher risk than normal, maybe during a context of social inequalities, or maybe there's high level of illiteracy among parents or absenteeism of the parents within the family. So the child need to better prepare themselves to go to school. And then in middle childhood, the main set of interventions, by the way, the prevention standards do not uh, provide a catalog of uh, like a repertoire of um, <clears throat> or repository of like what brand of a package is the one with the significant preference, but rather talk about the family of packages within that context. And within all of these packages, what are characteristics of these packages that make them effective for the science and characteristic that make them ineffective. So this is a way to support also policymakers to have an evidence-based programs acquired if need be, but if they have their own programs in place to contrast their programs to what the science says and see how to improve their own programs to become more effective. So in the middle childhood, we are talking about personal and social educational skills. Um, we're talking about packages, as I mentioned, you know, as mean of example, um, uh, packages where uh, a child can uh, learn about their emotions, how to stop before reacting uh, uh, anger management uh, related packages things that are related how to build a relationship with other kids how to listen to the instructions of the teachers we're talking about that context of personal and social skill at this age um, that sort of packages can be universal in green classroom management uh, packages are very important in middle childhood for the prevention standards these are packages that really sort of uh, help change the momentum of how the teacher uh, manages the class rather than change the content of the class per se. You know, an example of you know one of the famous packages under this is the, the good behavior game. Um, uh, not to advertise, but that's a very known package in this. But it's a package where the teacher that is providing, let's say, chemistry, physics, biology, whatever, um, takes the kids that are in the, in the classroom, change the way they sit within the class in terms of themes, you know, the thing, kids that sit in the back, you know, one of them will mix. So if you have 30 kids, you group them into five teams of six kids. And these, uh, each team has a mix of high attention, you know, kids that sit in the front and low attention, kids that sit in the back, uh, high, at, at, um, high absenteeism, low absenteeism, um, um, respect of rules, not respect of rules, the mix, you know, of, of these different kids. And they make, um, the kids sit, be part of teams and the teacher continues uh, providing their uh, classes while um, there are specific rules that need to be followed. And the rules have to be followed by all the members of each team. And the team is either rewarded or withdrawn a privilege based on the, on, on the action of every single kid within that team. So kids start helping each other really adapt to the um, rules set by the teacher rather than just leaving the, the, the class management loose. Uh, 
So the way the class is managed improves, and these are very effective to reduce, especially the level of aggressiveness in certain classrooms. So the most disturbed um, classrooms benefit from them most. Other sets of packages within this age are policies to keep children in school. Things that encourage, you know, more schools to be available, um, uh, access to school, um, you know, for example, conditional cash transfer packages, uh, packages that encourage uh, families that particularly are from facing social inequalities to receive their packages of social assistance, for example, conditional on the fact that their kids are in school. Anything that encourages kids to go to school per se, uh, and that's not a package of particular uh, prevention program, but kids being in school by itself is a prevention mechanism. And then we move to early adolescence. And this is where the social competencies become, of course, adapted to that level of development, as I said, like the normative understanding of who they are, what they want, how, what is an adult um, 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 understanding in certain the, 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 the harms of, of drug resistance skills, how to say no. Um, or these kind of packages need to be put in place. Um, these are universal in, in nature. And um, package that, that improves school attachment per se, and the school ethos, ethos. I mean, I'm talking about early adolescence and adolescence, of course. Um, these packages per se really and encouraging the retention of the kids. The more the kid is retained in school, the more the kid stays in school, that by itself is prevention. And But they require a different level of engagement, of course, at this age than, than in middle childhood. And of course, depending on the age of initiation in different countries, uh, whatever are environmental policies start playing an important role too, because this is an age where initiation of substance use can start. And the more environmental policies are there that sort of delay or sort of may provide an obstacle for the person uh, that is contemplating use to reach that substance, um, you know, delaying the age of onset of the substance per se is already an important step. You know, stopping it altogether may be uh, better, but, you know, delaying its onset to a later age is important. So basically, um, the school policy regarding to substance use, the alcohol and tobacco policy in terms of because these are the uh, available substances in many communities, um, delaying that age of initiation as well are key minimum age of restriction of minimum age of purchase of alcohol and tobacco raising taxation on tobacco make it more difficult for them to buy it but also the school policy and the school policy does not apply by the way on kids only it applies on the general atmosphere of the school i'm talking about the the entire ethos from the bus driver to the class to the managers of the school to the teachers to the to everyone to the, uh, to, the to the students to everyone within the school they have to you know have a school policy in terms of what is the school policy about drugs and how am i a part of it and they have to be and the parents should be part of it it has to be a a, a policy that is more leaning towards how to retain kids including kids that are challenged or at risk or maybe early initiators of substance use to stay in school as much as possible. Because there are certain policies that are applied, and this is where the prevention science start to separate what is effective from what is not effective, um, uh, which is important because the worst outcome that has been portrayed in certain interventions um, is not um, a lack of effectiveness. Sometimes there are certain interventions that have iatrogenic effect, meaning that it is that intervention per se that caused the problem from occurring rather than prevented it from occurring. So that's why decision making in terms of what works and what does not work uh, has to be based on that level of uh, prevention. Um, addressing being aggressive against the drug is, is a policy. But supporting and helping the child to be retained in school as long as possible is a different mindset. Um, the reason I'm mentioning this long introduction is the fact, for example, very commonly there are uh, mandatory urine testing uh, modalities done in school. In terms of screening kids, and you tell them, are you doing prevention programs? Yes, any kid that is using drugs is kicked out of school. Fine, kicked out of school, but that child did not disappear from the radar. That child is still in the community. What happened to that child? So packages like this, packages of prevention have to be maintained in such a way uh, to keep the child keep the child as much as possible in interaction with these microstructure of social support to avert that problem being at, um, reaching a different level of 
uh, risk at a later age of development. And that's why you see within adolescents the value of having this indicated level of prevention, which is addressing individual vulnerabilities. These packages of like, you know, uh, these social assistance, uh, social assistance or uh, psychologists or whatever you, you name them within the schools that really help kids that are facing particular challenges or have initial um, symptoms of a problem being readdressed by brief interventions and other modality before they escalate into something bigger. So these are a lot of spectrum of interventions that are there, but um, I will not be, with the sake of time, able to go into their entire details, but I'll just give you the general introduction of these. But just to give you a, an idea that that science, while it comes most of the time from high income countries, where the culture of research is more elaborate, that translation of research, as well as reflection on its effectiveness uh, within our programmatic approach, a coordinated global program uh, in, on prevention, now operating in above 45 countries. Um, and you see the diversity of culture, races, whatever ethnicities you want to see, that science is universal. Because a certain child at a certain age of development, regardless of who or, or where they are, or who they are, requires a certain support from them as a person in terms of their character and support for the structures that are taking care of him or her. So um, you will see a very large diversity and I appreciate most of the audience is coming from South or Southeast Asia uh, that, you know, we have piloted whether it's going to be at the family skills and life skills uh, perspective, uh, several packages in different countries that I'm happy to avail in more details separately. But I want to highlight the fact that we stress a lot on life and social skills because these are packages that build the individual uh, resilience against him, his or her own vulnerability. Um, they, it, it, they are most of the time teacher led and, 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 and help kids interactively build their own skills in terms of challenging normative belief, resistance of pressure. And, but then at the end of the day, because they are teacher led, the teacher has a certain level of relationship that is time bound with the children at a specific age of development that it's not continuous, right? Family as a social institution is a structure where the relationship between its members have, um, you know, have a history, have a future together and they share genes and they share lots of things together. So how that family functions over and beyond what can be built within the individual is a very important uh, component in terms of development of the youth that also can help education within the school. And that's why, because we put a lot of attention on the family component, so with the support of the, including the USINL and many other partners, um, we developed parenting packages that, open, of course, there are lots of family skills packages out there, but not all of them are open sourced and designed for low income countries or middle income countries in terms of an infrastructure of implementation. So uh, Strong Families, for example, is one of these packages that are designed for parenting under stressful circumstances, and Family United is more universal. And these packages, some of the packages that have been implemented in different countries, but just to give you an idea, in terms, these are not packages that help parents um, become law enforcement officers within the family and see if their kids are using drugs, but they are packages that help kids um, appreciate their own stress, Read the stress in their parents, parents communicating better with them, um, better bonding between the members and beyond. And the reason I am having these photos, uh, this is, for example, a photo of Afghanistan, uh, is the fact that um, these can be implemented in the school um, because the classroom is a very important setting to implement these skills. So basically, you need kids and their parents to come. And there are parallel sessions when the kids could be in one uh, room, the parents could be in the other. While the parents are discussing caregiving skills, the kids are taking skills from their own perspective. And then the family come together and play and practice what they learn together. The reason I'm mentioning it is that it's implemented in school, aside the fact that logistically it's good to have a classroom, they provide an opportunity for the family as a social institution to communicate with the school as a social institution. And that combination you will see from the, from the evidence I'm going to reflect later on is very is, is multiplicative in the effect of prevention beyond the individual effect of every single package. 
so you see like the simplicity is like this is from zanzibar um you know it's just paper and pen and uh, normal classroom this is these are photos from the philippines and from uh, central asia uh, this is also from the philippines uh, and from bangladesh as well so that's an important component that I, I will not dwell into more these to av avail more room for discussion, but uh, I want to reflect on the fact that we are, I mean, I talk about vulnerabilities in general that exist, but we are living now in a period of unprecedented level of vulnerability that came over and beyond what preceded the COVID-19 pandemic. So whether it comes to teachers, whether it comes to parents, everybody is, is kind of caregiving under stress, or teaching under stress and the kids are also stressed and strained by themselves so we've developed lots of tools to support caregiving in that context but also it's important to reflect uh, on the fact that and i think it will be amplified even more post pandemic and the in the further to the conflict related displacement and refugee increasing numbers um, environmental crises, such as we see in Pakistan and other countries, are increasing the number of uh, families that are uh, being um, under stress and displaced. The number of refugees and displaced families in Southeast and South Asia are not uh, unique in this, but they're facing it as well, whether from a natural disaster perspective or from conflict perspective in some of these countries, the number of refugees is in constant rise. So it's very important to reflect that there are specific tools to support families and caregivers within that context to better uh, give a better chance for their kids to overcome their mental health uh, as well as their other challenges that are faced within um, these contexts. Because in many instances, um, families as a social institution is the main frontline defense for these kids. And there are lots of tools to support these families from leaflets to booklets, you know, in terms of they require no training and just dissemination to packages, for example, strong family to packages that require trauma. I will not go into its detail, but I just want to highlight the fact that these things exist and can support further programming. And the work we're doing in Bangladesh and the Cox Bazar region with the Rohingya refugees, and there's a YouTube clip that you can see here, is a good exemplification of like how this can be reached uh, in more uh, than one setting. So everything that I mentioned in terms of prevention, I mentioned in terms of small boxes, but these boxes are not independent. Uh, these boxes should be part of a system of prevention where everything is structured around the health and welfare and the development of, of the youth from the government in terms of finance and human resources, the regulatory framework, the training, to who is providing these services, to um, what filters in, in terms of what packages and whose ministry. So all of this cycle is important because the system of prevention provides um, what interventions and policies that are based on evidence need to be put forward and what needs to be withdrawn, how to change the culture of prevention and decision-making processes. That system provides a, a regulatory framework in terms of quality of implementation. It's not only the, the selection of what packages, but is it delivered with fidelity and high level of quality? Um, registries, monitoring, and evaluations are good in terms are important when it comes to decision making and investment in terms of moving forward. And the system of prevention helps us reach this. It brings all the different sectors together in terms of support. The small owners that are engaged in the health and safety of, of the of the of the child are all working together around one unified strategy of what prevention is, and the funding becomes more sustainable and uh, scalable when it comes to implementation. This is these are just I'm gonna finish by a few slides reflecting um what I talk about multiplicative effect. So this is for example um a study that was done on a community where randomly um, uh, a group of uh, of uh, kids um, were assigned as control. Another group received life skills education only. And then uh, another group received, um, and the, the control group is in blue. The, the group that took life skills education is in, say, light green. And another subgroup, the third subgroup, received uh, family skills and life skills education that I mentioned before, and that's the red group. So this is a community where the level of, of uh, um, 
crystal meth initiation is is high and uh, after four years and a half the three subgroups that i talked about <clears throat> were compared in terms of how much uh, crystal meth was used within each group and you will see among the control group reached five percent of that group used the substance the presence of life and social skills uh, the light green group almost half of course it would not cut it down to zero but at least prevented half of the kids from initiation of crystal meth four years and a half later but you know when family skills and life skills are combined together you see the, the how much multiplicative the effect is only 0.5 percent of the kids have used that substance afterward and the same thing has been seen in another study uh, on, on non-medical use of prescription opioids where you will see when we're comparing when kids were monitored from the age when they were in the sixth grade to twelfth grade you see in gray the kids that were in the control group versus the kids that are in the green line that took only life skills education compared to the group that are took parenting plus life skills education in blue and you see how much the level of pre percentage of prevalence prevention have been reduced by adding another component so it's the components of evidence-based prevention when it comes to a system of prevention are not additive, but multiplicative in terms of an effect. I will end on, on saying that whether parenting skills, whether life skills, whether things that are related under that perspective of thinking of prevention are not only linked to the prevention standards of drug use, but there are common denominators that are linked with several high interagency work for example when it comes to prevention of violent extremism of course it requires a lot more than life and social skills and parenting skills but you can appreciate that sort of area of development and support how much it prevents uh, that level of engagement uh, violence against children inspire initiative is you know i n s p i r e is like seven strategies each letter each, each, each letter is a different strategy P is for parenting and caregiving support, and E is education and life skills. And you can see how these are very supportive. And this is an interagency platform where you know, DC is one of many, um, where um, these same packages that are linked to prevention of drug use are linked to prevention of violence against children. The same thing in terms of youth engagement and violence, and the same thing when it comes to uh, mental health uh, development in adolescence. And post COVID-19, the level of violence against children, by the way, and mental health issues in children and adolescents is on the rise. And that's why this is a time to engage. The latest development we have at the policymaking level is that our Commission on Narcotic Drugs that really oversees, these are the member states, including yours, um, your governments. Uh, in terms of resolutions moving forward this year in 2022, there has been uh, a resolution that has been unanimously passed on promoting comprehensive scientific evidence based prevention, which is a very important um, prevention based resolution. And from the perspective that <clears throat> early prevention is perceived in terms of early ages of use, not early in terms of the time of initiation before it escalates something more and really reflects the importance and the value of school engagement in that level of prevention so i will end by saying that that way of thinking that approach of prevention when schools are part of it and appreciates it um, really supports um, not only one of the targets of sustainable development goal three on health which is supporting prevention but that same modality is linked to many other sustainable development goals that support the country's development and they may be from um, gender equality, from, from uh, improving education, and from the sustainable development controls, uh, SDG 16, when it comes to violence prevention and beyond. So I think I exhausted my time with this. And um, instead of continuing speaking myself, I would just pass the floor back uh, to the organizers. Maybe there are also questions to address. Okay, thank you very much, Wadi, for that wonderful presentation. So for all of our participants, kindly send your questions to the chat box and uh, please send it to all presenters. So the all, all panelists rather, rather than just Wadi, so we can assist in reading this. So while waiting for that, I do have a question. So we all know that there are a lot of practices that we have done in the past few decades, so to speak, that are not evidence-based. So what are what will be the consequences of continuing these practices? especially for us in the community level? Yeah. Well, at best, at best, uh, it's a waste of resources. And in the time uh, we are living in, and as I said, 
this is the time to engage because now vulnerability at a higher level than before, it's ethically wrong. But the problem is, as I mentioned before, that the lack of uh, scientific evidence when it comes to prevention, the best case scenario is not lack of effectiveness. There are several interventions that are still being done under the umbrella of prevention that are actually are causing more harm than good. And that presents for us a different level of ethical dilemma when it comes to implementation of prevention. Um, I'm happy to provide examples of these, but I mean, and the reason why I'm saying like, you know, even if we are on the best case scenario, it is ethically wrong. So, but uh, the situation is ethically more wrong than, than, than we think. And that's why we urge and we push our member states to really rethink how, what, they, what, they're, what they're doing, just because there's a lot of things that really are effective out there. And by the way, not only I'm mentioning in terms of these, all of these things need to be acquired. Um, the reason why the prevention standards are there is that there are several things that are being done by member states that have never been assumed that they are part of the drug prevention strategies just because the intervention per se does not discuss drugs. So they have to revisit what they have on the ground, what is more in line with the standards and what is not, and filter out things that are very far away from what the prevention standard mentioned and strengthen the things that are more in line before they acquire new programs and add to their arsenal. So there is a lot of things that actually to be to talk about optimistically, there are many things that they have not accounted for that they're doing good, but they have never registered that that is drug prevention. Okay. So thank you for that. I think that when we talked about resources, this is the language that policymakers um, understand. So um, not only is that it's ethically wrong, it could actually create more damage because, because we know it doesn't work. And then um, we're also wasting our resources, which are important for, for countries like um, developing countries. Uh, okay, so while waiting, I have another question. I know that UN ODC's um, materials are free of charge. It can be accessed in your website. Um, but when you talked about the programs like uh, Family Universal, Family First, um, who can they get in touch to in terms of their own country so that I would assume that training is needed for them to be able to implement it? Or is this mm -hmm. just something that they can peruse on their own? Well, we have two sets of packages. We have packages that are designed to be top down and packages that are bottom up. Mm -hmm. So top down packages like the prevention standard I mentioned, these are packages that are designed for policymakers mm -hmm. to change the way the discussion and the thinking process is being done at the country level. The policy, the prevention standards are free of charge and available. Uh, you know, everybody that has been trained, for example, on UPC is articulate in this and can engage in this, but also we're happy depending on the country that you are in. Uh, our offices are there, whether at the country level or at the regional level, to really avail these materials or actually entertain, uh, you know, training um, uh, on, on these prevention standards. They're free of charge, of course, um, you know, especially now with the, with the way we're doing it now, we do a lot of these things where we just avail them, we avail our time and then provide the content. These are top down. So when you change that policymaker perspective, service providers have a better chance on engaging on evidence-based tools. Now, when it comes to bottom-up approach, these are tools that are for service providers that, demo when demonstrated on a national basis, encourage policymakers and their effectiveness on national encourage policymakers to move them to scale. Um, these, um, you know, the the tools that are availed and de developed by UNODC are copyright-free and royalty-free. But the only thing that they need is a consultant that, you know, train them, train the people. They're not self-taught. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the only investment that is needed when it comes to adaptation. But again, anybody who's interested can, I mean, if they don't know the contact of the UNODC office at the country or regional level is, I mean, I'm happy to put them in contact with us. Uh, if they contact me, I can put them in contact with them and we'll figure out a way in terms of how to avail these materials. Noting that there are some material that I mentioned like leaflets and booklets on parenting and caregiving that are self-read and self-taught, that are free of charge, require no training, and these are ready to be disseminated uh, at no, I mean, immediately, but it's only that training component that might require a bit of uh, discussion. Yeah, so it would be the more extensive program that would require training. Um, yes. Are there translations for international standards? Um, is it available in language other than English? 
it is available in few languages, maybe not all. Yeah. But whoever is interested in them, we can, uh, you know, and whoever is, I mean, already also have the infrastructure to translate them, we welcome translations in, in any language. And I, I guess a tip from someone who also uh, used to work for an international organization, you guys could actually advocate for it to be translated into your own yes. languages. Yes, I mean, we, we have no reservation, anybody who's interested, in, but just like engage with us to avail you the templates and they can be translated. And as long as they're useful for your work and your engagement nationally, we welcome their translations and some of them are already translated, but I don't have a complete list. The, the WHO, the international standards are available in many languages, but not necessarily in all the languages of the uh, attendees. Uh, I know at least 14 languages it's available. And I have to also reiterate what uh, Dr. Wadi mentioned earlier about their materials that are uh, printed and readily available, like especially for us in school, like it's actually very easy to print and UNODC do provide a lot of beautiful infographics that's developmentally appropriate. There are, um, it's multicultural and it could actually be, um, it's not, it's not something that we have to actually spend for. We just have to print it and disseminate it for everyone. So are there any other Further questions? Um, so I think we're right good on time. We're four minutes. So I'm ahead. happy to avail um, a link. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's a mailing list that's available by some for everybody who's there. Uh, I think there might be from okay. I, this yeah. is not my 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 account. I'm just I'm happy to avail links to many of the resources I mentioned that, you know, people can, I mean, I don't have them at the spot right now, but I can, if there's a mailing list, I'm happy to avail it for people that are interested. Yeah, I also said we can work chat. together to send those. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. I also sent in the chat box the uh, website for UNODC, and there you'll be able to find a lot of materials for prevention, for treatment, and any other information that you need to know. So... I can uh, mention one more thing that between brackets that um, as we are um, right now, we the only new development that I did not mention before is we are developing guidelines on improving the role of law enforcement officers when it comes to drug prevention within the school settings. This is also work in progress and uh, it progressed. I mean, we are in the third draft of the revision and hopefully by next year, these guidelines will be out for those that are interested in, in this topic. Oh, there's a question. Can you give some advice for school if you know if a kid is using drugs? Um, so what to do if we know that there are children that's using drugs in the school setting? There are, I mean, there are, and this is a very important question. The school uh, and drug related issue, there are several scenarios linked to drugs, right? And there has to be a protocol within the school in terms of a general strategy, not, you know, reactive, but proactive, you know, that sort of school policy when it comes to drug use, if there is a child who actually asked about the substance or a child who knows that there is a substance that's being sold and did not report it, or a child who saw a substance use and did not talk about it, or was there when the substance was used, or a child is used. So there are several scenarios that happen in school. And the school should have a general school policy on every in every single scenario what is the school policy when it comes to these things? And not only this, by the way, I'm mentioning the students, right? It could be the teacher, it could be the bus driver, it could be the, anybody, right, within school. So that policy applies to all. Every single scenario has to be part of a specific reactive strategy, not reactive, but a strategy like policy of the school that the students should be aware of ahead of time. The parents are aware of, the school principal is aware of, and there are lots of guidelines that we can provide in terms of what the school policy about this. But the main principle of it is retaining the child in the school as much as possible and resorting to expulsion being the last case scenario. But this is not a policy that is, you know, biblical in the sense of like this is the commandments. But these are part of the things that the school should engage in preemptively and have a general policy about it. And everybody within the school is aware of, of these of these things. That is the general policy that needs to be applied. So thank you for that. To reiterate what Dr. Wadi has said, please don't kick out students who are using drugs in your school. You're not going to help them. And as he mentioned earlier, they might not be in school, but they're still part of our community. And I guess also there's, um, I, I was like about to say something that we were, that we discussed before in 
one of the meetings at UNODC. So when it comes, so when we do like, uh, so normally like in the school, right, we discourage children from smoking or drinking, but this policy should not only apply to them. Okay, so if you have teachers that are smoking right in front of the school, then you're undermining your policy. So that's things that we should consider like uh, for us. So it's not only that the prevention is not only targeting um, children and adolescents, but we should, uh, as adults, we have the responsibility to actually mimic responsible behaviors as well. So in right. different sense. inside the school and around the school, by the way, yes. I mean, having a school policy and having a tobacco stand, you know, outside this, you know, is also not productive. Sale of alcohol and tobacco should be like there should be a, a zone within around the school where this is not the place. This kid has to be feel safe coming to that environment and appreciate them. when I'm in that environment. This is the ethos. That's how the environment thinks, and I'm part of that larger family. Okay, so um, we are right on time. If there are no more questions, again, our appreciation for Wadi who is recovering from his surgery. So thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us and for the rest of our participants so um, good evening good morning so thank you once again and um we will send um farley will coordinate with dr wadi for the mailing list so that people will be able to get in touch with him so that he can refer you to the appropriate networks so thanks you thank you once again and have a good day everyone goodbye bye, -bye. thank you thank you to our translators so much Thanks, everyone.